enorme prazer que eu gostaria de apresentar o Dr. Stephen Fleming. É, ele é atualmente vice-presidente e diretor executivo da Enterprise Innovation Institute, da Universidade Georgia Tech. É, ele tem 10 anos de experiência, ele, é, ele se formou na Georgia Tech, então ele é um ex-aluno da Georgia Tech, e daí ele foi trabalhar em uma empresa de private equity, né, no, no, como um investidor é, de capital de risco. É, e ele passou também é, parte da sua experiência nos laboratórios da ATT é, Bell Laboratories, da Nortel Networks, e também é, fundou uma startup. É, ele é investidor em três companhias é, aeroespaciais é, privadas. Né, e ele atua no board trustee trustees na Tech High School de Atlanta. Esse instituto que ele é diretor, ele é um instituto, ele vai falar bastante um pouco sobre isso e das e do papel que é, a Georgia Tech e o instituto dele está tendo nessa promoção do empreendedorismo tecnológico nos Estados Unidos. Né? São projetos aí bastante estruturantes e nós temos muito interesse e agradecemos muito pelo convite dele ter aceito de fazer essa palestra aqui conosco e de estreitar o contato com o Brasil. Stephen, please uh, thank you again for your invitation. You can come for uh, to start your your speech. Those of you wearing headsets, uh, Daniele will be translating. Uh, those of you not wearing headsets, um, people who are born in the United States tell me I speak English too fast. Um, Those of you for English is not your first language, I will be speaking too fast. Please tell me to slow down. It's okay, I won't be embarrassed. So, um, thank you for having me here today. I like coming back to Campinas. Uh, my wife actually uh, graduated from here in computer science uh, uh, before almost anyone in this room was born. Uh, <laughs> I hate to admit. Um, but uh, I've been here on campus three or four times now, uh, four times now. And uh, this, this campus feels the closest to my campus, Georgia Tech, uh, of, of, the, of the universities that I visited in Brazil. So, so I enjoy coming here and uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you. Uh, as, as Robert said, uh, I've been doing this for uh, a long time. Um, I actually had to count uh, for uh, a program that I'm involved in, uh, the i program that I'll explain uh, a more a little later how many startups I've been involved in as a entrepreneur, as an investor, as a board member, as an advisor, uh, as a trustee, and uh, I stopped counting when I got to 40. So uh, I have done a number of startups in my career. Some have been reasonably successful. Uh, some have uh, made a great deal of money. Uh, some have been disasters. Uh, and have lost a great deal of money, and some have been in between. But uh, I, I, have, I have done this uh, for uh, a long time, and uh, what I'm doing now in my career, really on my third career, uh, I spent a while in the telecom business, I spent a while as an investor, and now I'm uh, giving back by spending time at my university, which is Georgia Tech. How many of you are familiar with Georgia Tech? Do you know about Georgia Tech? Uh, a few, okay. Um, I'll mention just a couple of facts about it. Um, whoops, except that I went too far. Back up. Um, these, these are our rankings, if you believe in rankings. And, uh, you know, the, the bad news were number four. The good news when the ones in front of you are Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, Stanford, and Berkeley. Number four is not bad. So uh, we're, we're pleased with our, with our ranking. We've uh, been a very strong engineering school for a long time, like Unicampi. Um, we don't do anything else. Uh, we're purely an engineering and sciences school. Uh, we do not have medical school. We do not have dental school. Uh, we don't have a law school. We don't have humanities. Uh, we're engineers. That's, that's what we are. Um, so show of hands in the room. Um, I'll try to guess first. Electrical engineers, electronic engineers, how many? Okay. Um, mechanical, <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, I'm obsolete, I don't know about you. Uh, mechanical. Uh, chemical. Computing. Food science. Okay. What did I forget? Who hasn't raised your hand yet? 
Advertising, okay, all right. Anybody else? Pharmacy. Pharmacy, okay, all right. We don't have that either, but okay. Anything else? Okay, so we, 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 we have a lot, of, a lot of DNA in common. Um, we just got the rankings out uh, from, uh, from London, uh, best engineering schools in the world, and we were ranked number nine in the world. Uh, that, was, uh, that was nice, because this is the first time that we've actually broken into the top 10. And uh, I'll be talking about our incubator, which is one of the operations for which I'm responsible, uh, which is ATDC down here, the Advanced Technology Development Center. Uh, and uh, Forbes magazine just ranked us one of the 12th best in the world. Uh, so that, that was a nice compliment. Uh, we also, and again, my wife is Brazilian, and she told me not to use this picture because she says it's very imperialistic of Uncle Sam pointing at you. Um, but this is their, their slide. This is from the National Science Foundation uh, of the United States. Uh, and i which I'll be talking about, is a program which is taking a lot of what you've been learning about business model, uh, business model development, customer discovery process, and things that I'll be talking about today, and trying to get that spread through the research community in the United States. Uh, they picked two schools to start that off with, and we were one of those two, us and University of Michigan. So. Um, we, we know a little about startups. I, this is the agenda for what I'm going to talk about today. There will be a break, don't worry. Um, I have far more slides than I need, and I've seen them, so I don't need to see them again. Um, I will be happy to go through lots and lots and lots of slides, um, or you can download them and read them some other day. I also am really happy to answer questions. Uh, so if something comes up and you want to stop and ask me a question, Raise your hand if I don't see you. Start raising your hand a little more violently and then stand up and yell, it's okay. Uh, but I'd, I would rather answer your questions than go through all of my slides because as I said, I've seen the slides and they're available online. There is an address on the first page and there's an address at the end uh, where you can download them. Uh, but, uh, but I do wanna talk a little about you know, what, what we doing, are doing at universities, some things we've learned about startups, uh, business models and discovery, I think most of you have done that, the canvas, some discussion about telling stories and how to present your story, uh, some examples of execution, mostly through the National Science Foundation, and then some dedicated time for Q&A at the end. Uh, and I'm going to ask Vanessa, we're supposed to have a break, what, at 10.30? I will lose track of time. So if, I, if we get to around 10.40 and I have not stopped, stop me. Okay, questions before we start? Audio good, translation good? Okay, let's dive in. I wanna talk about a little history. These are some people in my department that went through a publication about what is the role of a university? And this was not specific to Georgia Tech or even specific to the United States. This was about looking at universities in general. And really, universities as we know them go back about 800 years. Uh, this is Oxford, but it could just as easily be Paris, or it could be Lisbon, or it could be Milan, or it could be in China, uh, or it could be in Damascus. Um, universities, it turned out, started at about the same time all around the world, and what they all had in common was big, heavy stone walls around them. And universities were designed to be storehouses, to be safe places to store information. Because one of the primary roles of the university was to hand down knowledge from generation to generation to generation. Because if you didn't, and if the wrong person died at the wrong time, what that person knew would die with that person. They weren't really about creating new knowledge because between the Bible and Aristotle, that was all you were supposed to know. And so the university was really about passing down the Bible and Aristotle. And that model lasted for a long time. The model lasted for hundreds of years. Really about, really about 200 years ago, a different model started being uh, seen really when the Industrial Revolution hit uh, really Northern Europe and, 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 the, Uni and the United Kingdom. Um, the idea of the university as a knowledge factory and for the first time, people started seeing universities as a place where you would get new knowledge, where you would put in resources of buildings and laboratories um, and smart young people and hopefully smart old people 
uh, and put them together and you would get new knowledge out the other end, just like a factory where you add raw materials in one end and get a finished product out the other. This was new. This was a difference in the way people saw universities. And that's really Georgia Tech's history, my university's history. Uh, these were our first two buildings. We're almost 130 years old. And I like showing this photograph because this building, which is still here, except my pointer isn't pointing, my pointer is very dim. Uh, this building, which is still here, that was classrooms, libraries, offices, uh, research labs, um, administration, all of the office work uh, and, and classroom work took place in this building, which is still there. This one has since burned down. Uh, that was a machine shop. That was a factory. Uh, and so all of our students, uh, they were all men at the time, sorry ladies, uh, they, would, they would spend the morning in the classroom building, you know, teaching themselves uh, out of textbooks. Then they would come next door and they would work on steam engines and work on textile looms and work on other, other pieces of equipment. So our history goes back very much to this industrial revolution model. And so this, this model is very familiar to us. This model really dominated universities in the 20th century. Um, Unicampi is a relatively new university. Uh, you notice there's not, there's not stone walls around Unicampi. There's no stone walls around Georgia Tech. Um, this, this is a model of you bring in resources, you get new knowledge out. A third model is emerging. And the idea here is of a knowledge hub with the university here in the middle and many other organizations connecting to it. And universities play a unique role in society is that everyone is willing to talk to a university. Everyone's willing to work with a university. Everyone has relationships with a university. And really no other element can sit in the center uh, as a hub of a network like that and connect other parts. So when you look at a university like Georgia Tech, or I suspect like Unicampi, um, Here's the various constituencies that we serve. There's probably more, but they don't fit on my slide. Um, you have to have faculty at the top or they get mad. So the faculty go at the top. Um, then you've got the, fa the staff, the students, you can read this, going around the circle uh, with entrepreneurs, investors. Over here is, is, is government agencies, large industrial partners. There's lots of different connections that a university can make, which really no other organization is able to make. So this is, this is the third role of a university. We didn't lose the role of being a storehouse. We didn't lose the role of being a knowledge factory. But now we have this role as a knowledge hub or knowledge connector. Okay? And, uh, and I'll remind those of you taking notes, these slides are online, so you don't have to try to copy all of them. So, um, so this, is, this is what I do. Uh, I, I run this thing called the Georgia Tech Enterprise Innovation Institute. Um, innovation is one of these words that is, at least in the states, is very much overused. Is the same true here as well? Everyone talks about innovation. Uh, even this guy talks about it a lot. Uh, the first step in winning the future is encouraging American innovation. And even a year later, standing in the same podium, said, after all, innovation is what America has been all about. Uh, the problem is nobody knows what he means. So. Um, I just went to Amazon.com and started searching for books with the word innovation in the title. And I found all of those, and I found all of those, and then I finally found Innovation for Dummies, and I finally stopped. Um, there's a lot of books out there. There's a lot of definitions of innovation out there. This is the one that I've been using for several years now, and I like this one. This works well at a university. Research is the transformation of money into knowledge. We know how to do that. That's the, that's the university as a research factory or a knowledge factory. But innovation is the transformation of knowledge into money. And so somebody somewhere has to pay for it. And I don't, and I don't mean a grant agency. I mean a customer who's going to put it to use, uh, whether through a license to a large corporation or whether through an entrepreneurial activity, a company, as, as, I've talked about, as we'll talk about later. Um, but the idea that it has to enter the world of commerce before it's an innovation. If you haven't done that, you may have an invention, you may have a discovery, you may have a Nobel Prize, but you don't have an innovation until someone's actually paid for it.
Questions on that? Okay. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the way Georgia Tech has been doing this because we've been doing this for a while. And we really divide our innovation into three segments, into what we're doing on campus with, with our students and our faculty, what we do in the community that we're part of, which is mostly the city of Atlanta, but it's bigger than that, um, and then beyond. And that, that's really where i -Corps, Innovation Corps, comes in. So I'm going to talk about each of these three separately. Um, the first one on campus, we start with a thing called Venture Lab. And Venture Lab is a program we've been running for, gosh, 12 years now, which finds research in the laboratory. This is before there's a patent. This is before there's a business plan or a business model. This is before there's a company. And Venture Lab tries to find matches for those to become startup companies. And so these are staff that work for me. It's five full-time staffers, and that's their only job. So this is a professor at Georgia Tech who invented a better kind of solar cell. Um, he should not run a company. Most professors should not run companies. They're really bad at it. Um, so what we did is we found an entrepreneur, experienced entrepreneur, uh, from, the, from the, our network of people that we know, got them together, raised some money, built a company, we'll talk about some, some more later, but created a startup where a company would not have existed before. So we see this as, as an important part of finding new homes for our intellectual property, and again, that innovation part of turning knowledge into money. So we're really good at research, now we're trying to be really good at innovation. To look at some of the statistics, this was last year. We review about 250 inventions per year. These, these are professors, postdocs, graduate students, and even a few undergraduates uh, who come to us and say, I've invented something, I want a patent, I think this is wonderful. And most of the time it's not, but that's okay. Uh, we take about 10% of those and make them a new project. 90% uh, of the time we don't. Um, we, it takes two or three years to get through the program, so we usually have about 70 in process. And we actually are getting about, about 15 or 20 companies out the door every year. So these are new startup companies uh, with at least two full-time staff and some level of investment and some level of customer relationship uh, that we're able to get out the door. And those companies in the last, uh, tw well, I think it's 12 years, uh, 12 years have attracted about $700 million in investment that would not have come to Georgia, would not have come to Atlanta without what we're doing. So that in terms of economic development, which is one of my roles, in terms of economic development, that's a, that's a hugely powerful number. So that's Venture Lab. Um, we also have a statewide program called the Georgia Research Alliance. And the closest I can come to this is a very, very, very tiny version of Hapespe. Uh, Hapespe has a budget that I wish I had. Um, but uh, this, this tries to fill some of the same roles of, of Hapespe, uh, but without the, you know, whatever it is, a billion uh, REI budget. Um, they have a lot of money. Uh, this, this has a budget of about $20 million uh, a year. And uh, one of the things they're able to do uh, is to make very small grants and loans to very young technologies just coming out of the laboratories. And it turns out that's really important, is once you've got customers, it's easy to find money to get more customers. Getting to the point of getting your first customer, no one wants to invest in you. That's as true in the United States as it is here. Uh, and so this is a way we've been able to get some technologies out the door through, through the Georgia Research Alliance, which this is part of the state government. So this is a, this is a public agency uh, in the state of Georgia. Um, this is the university commercialization process. There will be a test on this flow chart immediately after the, the presentation. Um, you're not supposed to read that. The, the, the point is that we have a process. Um, some universities don't. Some universities say, yeah, bring it in. We'll see what we think about it. Um, we have a high volume of presentations that come to us. We have a high volume of technologies to review. Uh, so we actually have put together a flowchart of, you know, what step are you at and where, what's next and what are the decision points and where should we take it, take it going forward. Um, and different inventions take different paths. So 
So there's, there's different ways of tracing your way through that, um, that flow chart depending on what you're trying to do. And I've since been informed since doing this slide, who are the computer science people? Raise your hands again. Yeah, that y'all don't learn flowcharts anymore, right? No, yeah, I'm old. So, yeah, you learned flowcharts in the 1970s. So. Okay, um, that was on campus. Let me talk about it in the community. We are part of the city of Atlanta. We're actually downtown in the city of Atlanta, uh, which is part of the state of Georgia, which is part of the southeastern region of the United States. And we feel an obligation as a public university, and again, there's two kinds of universities in the United States, those that are funded by taxpayers and those that are funded purely by tuition. We're funded partially by taxpayers who are a public university. We belong to the state of Georgia. And so we feel an obligation to the city and the state that we're part of to work on economic development for that region. The biggest thing we have is ATDC. You've seen this slide, the Advanced Technology Development Center. Um, this is our incubator. It, uh, we just, two weeks ago, uh, celebrated our 33rd anniversary. So we've been around 33 years. Uh, it's highly successful. It's graduated a couple of hundred companies. It's, gra it's brought about $2 billion worth of investment into the state. Um, and as I tell people when, when talking about University of Incubators, uh, we've been doing this a long time, 33 years. We've made every mistake at least once, sometimes twice. Uh, we've learned a lot about the right ways and the wrong ways to run incubators. So I actually have a consulting practice uh, that goes to other places and helps them uh, establish incubators. And uh, right now we're working in Puerto Rico, we're working in Colombia, we're working in Chile, we're working in Korea. Uh, and in all those places, uh, we have contracts to help them establish technology incubators based on our experience with what we've done at ATDC. So I um, would love to do that here. Uh, that's my commercial. Here's the five things that we think are important to a good incubator. Uh, I'm not going to go through them in detail because I realize that I'm not going to get anywhere near through as, far, as many slides as I want. But again, these are downloaded and you, and you can read them. But there's ways to run incubators that make sense. One thing which a lot of people don't realize, um, this is the logo of our university. Yes, our, our mascot, you know the word mascot? Uh, our, our, our symbol is an old car, go figure. Um, <laughs> but about 15% uh, of the companies in our incubator uh, actually come out of the university. So, plus the math, 85% don't. So most of the companies that we're working with are not directly based on university technology, are not based on patents or intellectual property coming from the university. Now frequently it's recent graduates of the university or frequently it's companies that are gonna hire students from the university but in general, we're reaching out to a much larger ecosystem than just what happens on side of our campus. And some universities get that, some universities really don't. Last thing I'm gonna talk about internally is Flashpoint. Flashpoint is about two years old. Uh, Flashpoint uh, started about the same time as i -Corps. And Flashpoint is based on a lot of the things that you have been learning in, in your preparation for this competition, uh, business model canvas, customer discovery process, lean launch pad, those, those I think are familiar concepts, I hope to most of you at this point. Um, what we decided to do, uh, how many people have heard of Y Combinator, the letter Y Combinator out of San Francisco? Okay, a couple of you. This, this is where a lot of this thought process came from. What we decided to do was to say, well, there's this whole new era of business model, canvas, customer discovery process driving new accelerators. And rather than try to retool our 33-year-old incubator in real time, why don't we start something new? Uh, and those of you who've read Clayton Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma, will understand. This is setting up something separate letting it thrive, and then if it works, you bring it back into the mainline process. So we, we set up a thing called Flashpoint, and Flashpoint is all about shared learning. Uh, it's all about bringing in small teams, actually very much like the teams in this competition. Uh, it's one semester, so for us that's 16 weeks, and it's a lot of work. Uh, actually, we insist that the students taking it drop the rest of their course load uh, for that semester. It's the only class they're allowed to take uh, because it's a lot of work. And uh, we're now in our third semester of teaching this. 
And uh, we've had some great successes. Um, several of our companies uh, have, have raised uh, a great deal of money. Uh, several of our companies have already been bought. Um, and this may not sound like success, but several of our companies have decided to stop. And that turns out to be a good idea because if you can learn that very quickly before you waste a lot of time, that can, that can be very useful. So this, this is a program we've been running on business model and technology development inside the university, but we run it for, again, the larger um, community. And that actually has started attracting teams from elsewhere in the country have started coming to Atlanta to, to run through this 16-week process. Last thing I'll mention is we do, do this thing called Startup Gauntlet. Uh, Gauntlet is, again, the same process. You'll see this again over and over again today. Uh, how many of you have seen this cartoon at this point out of Alex's book? Some of you, okay. Um, so it runs the same process. Uh, this is a freebie. Uh, this is free. Uh, we don't charge for it. Uh, so it's uh, a low threshold to get in. Uh, but it is pretty grueling. Uh, we we tend to run, we run, it, run it for six weeks. Um, it's just two hours a week for six weeks. And we experience about two-thirds attrition. So of 15 teams that start, only five will graduate six weeks later. So it's a tough process. And that's probably similar to what you guys are going through. And again, like Flashpoint, Gauntlet, i they're all modeled on the same set of learning, the Lean Launchpad uh, toolkit. So we're, we're using the same, the same work over and over again. Uh, and that's available again to anybody uh, in the Atlanta community. So that's something we do to, to reach out to the larger community. Questions on that? And the last thing I'll talk about here is i uh, Again, Uncle Sam, we want you for i uh, How many are familiar with the National Science Foundation in the US? It's the largest technology investor in the world. Uh, they invest about $7 billion a year um, until if you've been reading our budget issues in the United States lately that, well, we're not going to politics. Um, but about 20% of all research in the U.S. comes out of NSF, out of this one agency, one checkbook, uh, supports about 20% of all the research in the country. And they go all over the place. They literally run the, the stations in the Antarctic at the South Pole, and they've got telescopes in Hawaii and, and Chile and all this stuff. But you can read the list here, Biolog biology, chemistry, computing, earth and atmospheric and so forth. Really almost any sort of interesting technology except medicine, uh, NSF is invested in. And, and, and pharmacy, I guess, actually. I guess that kind of fits into medicine. Uh, there's another federal agency about the same size. Uh, the National Institutes of Health, they do medical, pharmacy, dental, life science stuff. Um, I forget all that, their details. But everything that's not medical uh, comes through National Science Foundation. So they're a big agency. They invest a lot of money. And they were asked uh, by President Obama, or his, one of his cabinet members, so you're investing $7 billion a year in science and technology, where is the economic benefit? Where's the payout? Where's the jobs? And they kind of went, oh, we don't really do that. Um, that was not an answer the president wanted to hear. Uh, and so he said, maybe you should think about that. So that's where i came from. i is the innovation core, i innovation core, same thing. And the idea behind i is developing entrepreneurial knowledge and really entrepreneurial vocabulary and mindset among the scientists and engineers that receive funding from NSF. And they use the Lean Launchpad course, which I think a lot of you have, have seen at this point. And they really took everybody, they started out, they took everyone out to Silicon Valley and started teaching them in Silicon Valley about how do you do startups. And there's only one Silicon Valley. It, it's a limited scale. And so one of their challenges was, well, how do you scale that to the whole country? You can't keep running everyone through Stanford University. You can't run everybody through one instructor, Steve Blank. You know, you have to figure out a way to scale this. And so they came to two universities, us and Michigan, to say, let's take this national. Let, let's figure out a way to take this larger. Uh, and so we did. And so we now have been teaching this curriculum for um, over a year. Uh, we've run through, I've got a slide coming up later, 
We've run through about, um, I think we've taught three cohorts, three, team, three sets of teams, and then um, of our research, I think 11 of our teams have run through this process at various universities. So we're getting good at this, uh, and this process works. Now what, what we see is happening is other federal agencies, for example, National Institute of Health, which is for medicine, uh, the Department of Energy, uh, the Department of Defense, which is the Army, uh, other agencies that provide funding to technology and, and engineering development are looking at i saying, gee, maybe we, we should do that too. So, um, Wow, we're so behind schedule, it's not even funny. Um, how many people have watched these videos online on Udacity? Oh, good. That means I can go really fast through this part. Um, I'll catch up. So. This is, this is what we know now. I, I, for those of you who didn't, that was Steve Blank, entrepreneur, investor, friend of ours. Um, if you add it all up, since 1995, the U.S. has spent about a trillion dollars investing in startups. Trillion with a T. I don't know what that is in Portuguese, but it's a whole heck of a lot of money. Uh, I was doing this. I was, I was an investor at that point. And we know things we didn't know before. We know how to build startups. In fact, I work in an engineering school. So I would say that we know how to engineer startups. Uh, in engineering, is you, provide, you, you apply a predictable set of rules, and you know at the end of the day that the bridge will not fall down. So we're learning a lot about that. Um, I'm channeling Steve Blank here. So those of you who have seen the videos, I'm going really quickly. Those of you who have not seen the videos, they're free. Go watch them, because I'm going to try to catch up on time a little bit. Uh, but we used to think that a startup is a smaller version of a big company. And we know now that's just not true. I used to do that for a living. That's what I used to try to do. It's really hard. And the reason it was really hard is we were wrong. Startups are not just smaller versions of big companies. They're actually something different. And when you take the old, old, uh, old, school, the old skill sets, this is harder to read than I expected, but when you've got all the MBA tools and all the, all the techniques you use to run a big company, and you would try to apply those to a startup, it turns out it doesn't work. And a classic one, uh, again, my wife you know, graduated from, from here, from Unicamp, went to go work at IBM Brazil, and she learned to waterfall development and product management. And this is very simple. You get your requirements, you build your design, you implement, you verify, and then you do maintenance. That's the way software has been done since before there was software. If you try to do that in a startup, you'll die. This works at IBM. This works at Microsoft. This works at Oracle. This does not work in a startup because startups are different. Here's the quote that Steve Blank has become famous for. I hope people, how many people have seen this? A startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. How many people have seen that before? Okay. Those of you who haven't, let me say it again. Startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. A startup is not your business. A startup is a way to search for a business. I invested personally, well, it wasn't my money, but for, on behalf of the people that trusted me, I invested a couple of hundred million dollars into startups not knowing that. I still did okay. But it would have been a whole lot easier in the 1990s and the 2000s had I had this insight. And that really you go through this search process, and we'll talk about this in, in detail, and only once you've finished the search and found something do you move into an execution process, and that begins to start looking like a company that you're familiar with. And that's different. Because I'm really thrilled we're in our third year here of a business model competition because most universities, mine included, have always had business plan competitions. Ours is now 12 years old. We just held, we, we're on a different academic year because we're in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we just held our 12th business plan competition and I announced about a month ago, it's our last one, we stopped. We're not doing business plan competitions at Georgia Tech anymore. Because we used to think, you know, plan the work, work the plan, and you do an awful lot of Excel spreadsheets, and all you have to do is meet your forecast, and things work out well. And we now know that's not true. So 
This is a modified quote from Von Moltke. Anybody here know who Von Moltke was? Yeah, about three people. Uh, more than that, okay. He invented the German general staff, okay? He, in, he invented modern warfare. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but that's what he did. Um, and his, his famous quote is, is, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Uh, here, no business plan survives first contact with the customer. So all that work you put into that plan, as soon as you take it forward and try to do something with it, it doesn't work. So that's not appropriate for a startup. You need to do it someday because they have a purpose. And there's a place for a business plan. This may be too small to read, for which I apologize. And if you're, uh, table of contents, summary, business description, environment analysis, background. People recognize kind of this general table of contents. It's, there's nothing special there. You can, you can get that from any number of textbooks. Um, all, all of that's useful. It's a good place to collect your assumptions and collect your learnings. But don't try to execute on that until you know what you're doing. And you're not going to know for a while. So, yeah, is there a question? We're just stretching. Okay. I do take questions, so. And you can stretch, too. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, so here's what we know now. Um, most startups, I've been involved, as I said, in about 40 startups. A lot of them are train wrecks. How many people saw the movie Hugo? See the movie? Yeah, they showed a picture of this. This was real. Uh, this happened in, in Paris about 1880. Uh, and yeah, a train went the wrong way. And uh, uh, that's the way most of my startups went. Um, it's almost never that your startup is going to fail because you fail to build the product. You can build product. You're all engineers. You can build stuff. They almost always fail because they fail to make something that somebody wants to buy. And I look back at the ones I've been involved in, and yep, that was almost always the case. We always shipped something. We got a product. We got something that worked. Either nobody wanted to buy it or nobody wanted to buy it at that price, but nobody wanted to buy it. That's, that's the most common cause of failure for startups. How many people have seen this book? Show of hands. Yay. How many people read this book? Show of hands. Same ones. Okay. Read those books. If you hadn't read them, get, read them. This is the process that we've been using. And again, I talked about it at Georgia Tech. We're doing Flashpoint. We're doing Startup Gauntlet. Uh, with, uh, with the National Science Foundation, we're doing i -Corps. They're all using the same methodology, and it's all based around this. So I'm going to go through this part pretty quickly. And I am stealing these cartoons from Steve Blank's presentation. So those of you who saw it on Udacity have seen the cartoons. Anybody else not seen these? Okay, um, I tried to make them. <coughs> excuse me. I tried to make them big enough to read. We've been talking about a business model. So, what is a business model? How a company creates value for itself while delivering products or services for customers. What is it that your company does? So that's all that a model is. Is how are you going to create value and make your customers happy? It's harder to do, but it's easy. It's easy to, to describe. Uh, show of hands, how many people have seen this before? Okay, how many people have not seen this before? Okay, all right, it's a couple of you. All right. Um, those of you who have not seen this before, I'm going to go really quickly because I think most people have seen it. Uh, I don't want to get bogged down in teaching it again, but it, there is good information in there. Um, this is a structure put together by Alex Osterwalder in his Business Model Canvas book, uh, which I think is here. Yeah. Um, this is just a really interesting way of assembling knowledge, which we used to have all the bits and pieces of information, but by literally drawing it out and putting it on the wall this way, you start seeing relationships you didn't see before. Um, and so especially when you put it into a business plan and that hierarchical table of contents I showed before, you would, you would miss these connections. So um, the idea is, and I hope you realize this is not insulting anybody, it's just true, is that everything you put on that canvas when you start is probably a guess. And it's very likely that it's wrong. And the point of the, of the model is you take it from a work of fiction to replacing that with pressing the right button with facts. So you actually wind up with facts filling in these boxes that you can then actually build a real business on. 
So that's, that's the point behind going through the Canvas process. And all it is, all you wind up with, is the rationale of how you're going to create, deliver, and capture value. Creating is what it is that you do. Delivering it is finding a customer who wants to buy it. And capturing is selling it for more than it costs you to make it. So if you do those three things, you get to stay in business. If you don't do those three things, you probably don't get to stay in business. So the development process is search mode. And this is something that tends to appeal to the scientists and the scientifically minded uh, entrepreneur, is this is really applying the scientific method to building your startup. And so how many people are familiar with the scientific method the way it's supposed to work? So you observe natural phenomenon, you formulate a hypothesis, you test it, you change the hypothesis as necessary, you iterate through until you feel pretty good about it, and then you establish a theory based on the iterated hypothesis. Everybody, that was like ninth grade high school, right? Okay. Uh, how many people know how it really works here in universities? You make up a theory based on what the funding ag agency manager wants to be true, uh, you design the minimum experience to suggest that theory is true, you modify the theory to fit the data, you publish the theory as a hypothesis, and you defend it to the death despite all evidence to the contrary. Does that ever happen at Unicampi? No, not here. So, happens at Georgia Tech, let me tell you. Don't, don't do it that way. <laughs> don't do it that way. But the top part, this part, works. I mean, this goes back to Galileo. This goes back to Isaac Newton. This goes back to look at the real world, try to establish rules, iterate as necessary, and you wind up with some laws that you think actually make sense. Why don't we do that for our startups? And that's the insight that Steve Blank had. So the idea here is you have a question it's a value proposition that you think may or may not be worth something. You probably shouldn't trust your own judgment. So design a hypothesis. And when we're going through Startup Gauntlet, when we're going through i when we're going through Flashpoint, most of what we do is work over and over again on designing a good hypothesis, a controlled experiment. Then you didn't like any other scientific experiment, you only want to change one variable at a time. You bounce that off of the real world in some way through some sort of a test through with your product or your service. And I don't know if you can all move back and see this. This is the really hardest thing to do in this process. How many, how many of y'all been going through this iterated hypothesis as part of the contest? I hope most of you. Mm, not a lot of hands, okay. Uh, maybe missing this part. This is really important, is you take your best shot, you design a hypothesis, you design an experiment, you go bounce it off the world, and you come back with something which now is a fact. Congratulations, you've now learned something. The hardest part in this, this absolutely cannot be a sales pitch. The hypothesis cannot be, I built this, would you buy it? Yes, no. That's a really, really bad hypothesis. You're not going to learn anything that way. So when you're working on your hypothesis, you need to be way before the point of where you're going to build something, and you need to be way back at the customer problem. You need to be learning about their problem and when you're getting information here, you're getting facts here, you don't have a solution yet, you've got facts about the problem. And then there's one magic step. I can't explain why this is true, but it's true. You do that a hundred times. That's really hard, but I really mean it. You do that a hundred times. We've now run three cohorts of i three cohorts of Flashpoint, four cohorts, the cohorts of Startup Gauntlet. So we've had 10 sets of teams going through this where we make them do this. 
And so based on that data, what we discovered, let me back up one, is when you go through this cycle and you make a hypothesis and you go out and test it against the real world and you bring back the fact, we are all human beings. We're going to start with people that we know. We're going to start with our friends. We're going to start with our coworkers. We're going to start with people that we have some sort of relationship with and that are, that are relevant to that business. And as it turns out, somewhere around the 30th iteration around that loop, we all run out of friends. And then you have to start talking to people you don't know. And that's when the learning really happens. And all of the learning that really changes your mind about your business model happens after the 30th and between the 30th and the 100th iteration of that process. Now, is this part of the contest that you guys have been doing? All right. Yes, this is very difficult. You can uh, share a little bit with us how, because I think it's all about motivation as well, because mm -hmm. you have to get together and mm -hmm. see the other groups and doing so. If you give us some tips yeah. how we can make everybody to do this loop, to this, okay. uh, I'll be, thank you. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that with this picture. Anybody recognize him in Brazil? Probably not. Uh, this is Mark Twain. He's a famous American author from two centuries ago. Uh, his quote is, a man who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can learn in no other way. Um, there's really no other way to do this. Um, th this becomes a challenge of using your network. This becomes a challenge of getting your hypothesis right. Uh, this becomes a challenge for you just being willing to pick up the phone and call people or knock on their doors and ask people questions. Now, it depends on what your product or service is. If it's a consumer product, you can hang out at the shopping center and you can ask people questions with a clipboard until security comes and throws you out the door. Um, if you're doing, uh, what, who's, who's the group here doing the orange juice or the orange peel uh, feed? Um, one, one of the teams I'm looking at uh, this, this afternoon. Um, you know, that's very specific. You know, there, you know, you have very specific buyers and there are going to be individuals in large companies that are ch choosing a particular sort of you know, nutritional balance. And you have to find out who they are, you know, and, and that's research. And, you know, one of the reasons you don't want to sell in this process is when you go and ask this hypothesis, which is really about them, it's not about you. When you ask this hypothesis and you're collecting data, the last question you're going to ask them is, who else should I talk to? Now, if you've been selling them, if you've been trying to sell them your widget, whatever it is, they're not going to give you the name of their friends because they think you just wasted their time and they're not going to let you waste the time of their friends. If you've been truly gathering knowledge, and you may represent yourself as a, as a you know, campy student or, or not or whatever. I mean, it, it, it's good to have a university brand behind you. Um, if, if you are representing yourself as really gathering knowledge, and if they feel like they've had an honest transaction with you, and you've really been honest with them about what it is you're trying to do, then yeah, that last question is, who else should I talk to? They'll give you two or three other names. And then you call them. And you're honest with them. And you do that two or three more. And so you build the network that way. So a lot of us being really, really clear up front that you're not selling. Because as soon as people, we have, we are bombarded with advertising messages. We're bombarded with people trying to sell us stuff every minute of every day. So we have really good antenna for detecting when someone's trying to sell us something. Read your email. You know, you get these phishing emails of people trying to sell you whatevers. Um, bleep, delete. You know, we work the same way in, in our relationships. As soon as we feel somebody's trying to sell us something, we shut down. If we feel they're trying to learn something, hey, they're trying to learn something from me. That means I'm smart. I want to teach them. I want to tell them. It makes me feel good. And then when you feel good about it, you say, well, gee, you know, that was good. 
I'll tell them to contact my friend Guillermo and tell them to friend my, contact my friend Linda. And I'll tell them to contact my friend so-and-so. And therefore, you can actually get those relationships, but you can't sell. As soon as you sell, you shut it off. Other questions? Okay, this is really important stuff. Um, so the discovery process, you go through this iteration as often as necessary. What sometimes will happen is, you know, you, you ask questions and maybe it's before you've asked a hundred people, you, maybe you've only asked five or six, you realize, ooh, what I thought I wanted to build, nobody wants that. Hmm. Now what do I do? Well, they've all been talking about something related to it that sounds like a real problem. Maybe I should start asking questions about that instead. So you get a thing called a pivot. So people familiar with this concept of pivot? Uh, I'll come back to this later. Um, of the teams we've worked with in i -Corps, we've had, I, it's in my slides. If I get it wrong, I apologize. The slides are right. Um, I believe we've had 171 teams go through the i -Corps process. Out of 170, 171, 160 of them have pivoted to a different business model. They're doing something different than they thought they were going to be doing when they started the program. And that's a seven-week program. I mean, this is not over years. That's in seven weeks. Uh, but, but the way we do it, and we do this in, in the programs we teach at Tech, and we do this in i um, is, you know, we'll, we'll have a discussion. We'll say, okay, we'll, we'll work on your hypothesis. Let's, let's work on that. Go out and test that. And in the next week, you have to talk to 15 customers. So next Tuesday, let's come back and tell us what you learned from those 15 customers. And if you stand up next Tuesday and said, I only talked to three customers, we say, sit down, shut up. You don't get to talk this week. If you've talked to 15, we want to hear what you've learned. Then do that again, then do that again, then do that again. And again, somewhere in the second or third week, a lot of them have decided, you know, maybe I didn't validate what I thought was going to be true. But in the process, I validated something else, which, you know, I, th I think I can do that too. And someone's expressed a willingness to pay for that. And only at that point do you execute. Only at that point do you move into this part of the model of customer creation and company building. And it's really, really hard for engineers because engineers want to go build stuff. I want to go build stuff. I'm good at building stuff. And I'm telling you, don't do that yet. Do all of this for a while. And only down here, you get to build something. It's really hard for engineers to figure out that they have to do that. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> for your, exper your experience, how big has been the difference from the initial product for the final product after pivoting? All over the map. Some, sometimes it's very close, sometimes it's completely different. I mean, uh, the, the most dramatic one we've had was somebody who thought they were building better helicopter rotors and they turned out to be building a better light bulb. Um, using the same patent. Seriously, same patent, same technology. So, yeah, it's, it can go all over the map. Yeah. Questions, comments? Okay. Um, I have lost track of where the break is, but it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah. I've, I've, I've actually got a coffee cup picture in here, but I don't know where it is. So, uh, okay. So, customer development product. Test your guesses. Get some insight. Put them on the canvas. Your canvas is going to get cluttered. Your canvas is going to start looking ugly. At a certain point, you put it away, you start a new canvas. Don't, don't lose the old one. Uh, don't lose the old canvas. And I'm getting waved at by Danielle. Does that slow down? No, okay. Uh, okay. Um, start a new canvas with new hypotheses, new experiments. This is the other magic, and it's way down in the corner, so I hope you can read it. The other magic of this process is get out of the building. Pretend this building is on fire get out. Because the answers to the questions that you need to have answered aren't in this building. 
The answers are out there in the world. And the best way to test your hypotheses and to get information is to sit down face to face with someone who has those problems and have a conversation. Now, that being said, you're college students, you don't have a lot of budget for airfare, you have to go to class, you can't necessarily go flying around the world to go talk to people who have these problems face to face. Understood. Um, and again, it makes a difference what you're building. If it's a consumer-oriented product, yes, you should speak to people face to face because consumers are the same wherever you are. If it's very specialized, you're building something for the semiconductor industry and all of those customers are in the Pacific Rim in Malaysia or Taiwan or something, you're probably not going to go there every week. Um, phone calls. And that gets, you know, that's what Skype is for. Um, but, you know, do what you can to get as personal interaction as you can. Doing a survey or doing an email is almost useless. You learn almost nothing um, from an email or from a survey. You learn from having conversations with people. Because it's not necessarily the answers to the questions you're asking, it's what else they say that you follow up on. The best way to do that is in person because you pick up on the body language. If you can't do it in person, do it by phone and listen very carefully. But doing it by, by keyboard, you never get those cues. Questions on that? So get out of the building, get out of the building, get out of the building. Uh, I'm going to skip this part. Um, we, uh, we, we apply this process at Georgia Tech, uh, so we, we spend a lot of time uh, in that, that yellow circle. Here's our breakdown from our research. About 75% of the time, we will look at a technology and say, no, based on our experience, based on our knowledge, based on our guesswork, really, we don't think there's a startup here, so we're just going to license that out. About 10% of the time, we'll say, this is a science project. This is, this is never going to be worth anything to anybody, so you know, let the professor keep going with it. And about 15% of the time, we'll actually put it through our process. So you know, one out of six or one out of seven, uh, we'll actually take those and run it through, through our process. And the decision criteria we use to, 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 to decide that is you know, the very basics. Who owns it? I mean, if the ownership is fragmented across four universities and the federal laboratory, that may be too hard. Um, do we think there's a market that a startup can, can be viable in? And if what you want to do is build a new car, um, that's probably not something a startup is going to be able to do unless you're Elon Musk and a billionaire, which if you are, come see me. I want to talk to you. Um, how far along is the technology? I mean, does, does it only work in the laboratory or can you get it out the door? And then the most important one is the team, is the people involved. You know, because when we're, when we're talking to the professor, talking to the postdocs, we want to know how interested are you in really starting a company. And if the answer is we're not interested at all, then I'm not interested at all. If the answer is, eh, yeah, maybe. If it doesn't interfere with my grant proposal and my teaching load and all that, it's like, yeah, maybe. We're probably not interested either. It's like, yeah, I really want to do this. Yeah, I really want to do this. I really think this is important. And my faculty is agreeing with it, and my spouse is agreeing with it, and we all think we want to spend time with it. It's like, okay, yeah, we, this, this we'd like to do. This we'd like to do. So, and, and I kind of mentioned this already. So when we do this, we keep them in this customer discovery part of the process a long time, and it's really hard because a startup wants to be a business, and we keep them in search mode until they're ready. Engineers want to be down here. But if you go down here too soon and skip those steps, you may get lucky. It may work. It probably won't. The odds are against you. The odds are bad. The odds are bad.